Well, today we have uh, a really wonderful uh, gift. We have uh, the gift of Stephen Poplin, who I feel like I've been, I know knew him before he got here. We had uh, Judith and Jim introduced me to Stephen via Skype a few months back, several months ago actually. And he does some amazing work uh, with astrology, past life regression, um, psychotherapy. He's, he's got a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience and a great teacher and a great guy. And I'm so grateful that uh, we have this opportunity to experience Stephen. He came all the way from Iowa. He, uh, he's a wonderful teacher, and I know you're going to get a lot out of what he says. And today is all about cycles. Uh, I forgot the title. Big cycles? Big cycles, little cycles, and tricycles. <laughs> so, tricycles. So anyway, we are so uh, delighted to have you. I can't wait to hear what, because I'd like to know what the heck's going on. And you're going to talk to us from an astrological perspective. What's happening on planet Earth? And I like that. So let's give Stephen a warm Namaste welcome. and it's really great to be here. Uh, wonderful energy here. Boy, what a beautiful day. Well, North Carolina and the sun and uh, Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to you all. Uh, and some of you, of course, in my perspective, uh, may have been mothers maybe in past lives. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, other types of motherly sorts of things along these cycles because um, we have um, uh, the planets the, as goddesses, as gods, Gaia, Mother Earth, and we have then the Supreme Mother right there. And we partake in living here on the, the, uh, this live organism called uh, Gaia. Blessings to that. So I start off here um, sharing uh, something from the Bible, Ecclesiastes, and you might have heard this before. If you want to start humming, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which has been planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. You hear the melody. <laughs> A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Ecclesiastes, third chapter. Yes, so we are living on planet Earth, Gaia, and we have our seasons. Here it is springtime. We'll be heading then towards summer. Then we know what's going to happen after that. We're going to have a little bit of autumn, fall, winter. The seasons, these seasons come in. We have learned to dress, hopefully, for the different types of weather. I've got my shorts uh, ready to go. Um, and for the appropriate time and season. Sometimes, of course, there are storms. Sometimes the storms are happening inside. These are our in inner times, the personal times. And can we dress for that weather or be prepared for those storms that come in? 
through accidents, feuds, divorces, uh, losses, and uh, all sorts of things. Some people take these misfortunes and then they'll say, why me? People taking things personally and then they want to gnash their teeth. Let's all gnash our teeth now. <laughs> <laughs> Does that feel better? <laughs> yeah, there are, there are times when we might take things a little bit too personally. I like the ancient uh, Chinese saying, <clears throat> maybe it's a question, is a hurricane just? And of course, to the hurricane itself, it's just a mighty wind. But to us mortals, to us little human beings, these winds can come in, these storms can come in and wreak havoc. And then there is loss, and there is pain, a time to stay inside, a time to watch out for that. But the hurricane itself, it doesn't matter either way. It's, it's wind, it's storm, it's the weather. And we, we humans can interpret things and we can take things personally and we might shake our fists and gnash our teeth uh, but it's just the wind okay and it's good to know about the weather the big weather so I now read from uh, Plato Timaeus now when all of the stars the moving stars the planets which were necessary to the creation of time had attained a motion suitable for them and had become living creatures having bodies fastened by vital chains we would perhaps say gravity and magnetic forces today and learnt their appointed task they revolved some in larger and some in lesser orbit. Those which had the lesser orbit revolving faster, and those which had the larger more slowly. Plato. I'm an astrologer and a mystic, and I do my calculations. I get out my computer. I look at the stars, the planets, the cycles, uh, but then I intuit, I feel, I sense. We look at the symbols, we read the symbols, watching the signs, the synchronicities. It really is quite a fascinating show. And the planets are there as living creatures teaching us something. And sometimes it's a hard kick in the... And we may not like it, but again, the planets, very much like the hurricane, just doing my thing. So, let me introduce to you uh, the slower moving living things, the three outer planets um, that have in most recently in the Aquarian age has just come into our consciousness. And I begin this with a visual. And um, you know you've got a nice smooth pond, clear water. You dunk a, well, a child will throw a stone in it and there we have the concentric circles from that stone going into the water. And then there's this really interesting thing, and there's great photography about that. Um, right in the middle of that concentric piece, where the stone went in, the water reacts, pops up a nice little water ball, a, um, a, a piece just right there for a second, kind of like floating in the air. And then, of course, then it goes back down out into the water. We take that image and um, we're going to bisect it right in half because we're dealing with chronological time here and looking at some of these really interesting events and the discovery of these modern planets. And so with that in mind, here is the trough and then we have the big wave on one side and the big wave on the other. You, you got that? Mm -hmm. you see that? And of course then right here in the middle, that little ball, that plop, that kerplunk, that planet is right there floating above this piece. Okay?
So I begin with the first of the three transpersonal planets, the discovery. And this was a new discovery. A new planet had been discovered, the first in thousands of years, through mathematics calculations, and it was in 1781. Which planet was that? Uranus? Uranus. Uranus. Yeah. Which, by the way, there's various ways to pronounce it. <laughs> it was discovered in 1781. As far as I am concerned, that is the beginning of the Aquarian Age. I'm not waiting for it. It's here. You know, technology, here's a camera pointed at me. Lights, electricity, automobiles, jet planes. Looks Aquarian to me. As I said, the mathematics and calculations discovered that. Here we have the mind, here we have plotting, here we have thinking. And the two waves, the two waves, you know, 1781, the two waves on each part of that before and after the discovery of the planet. Before, we had the American Revolution. After, the French Revolution. And right there the whole time, the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> Inventions <coughs> like the cotton gin and uh, the steam engine. And then we had the air balloon. Right at that time, flight. And we're, we're Uranus as the old sky god. Just a coincidence. <coughs> we had the extremes, of course, with these revolutions. And uh, at the same time, hope and a vision, a vision about how we can all be together. And, of course, with the Declaration of Independence on one of these waves, one of these troughs. The, in France, we had the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, Uranus. And, Uranian ideals, Aquarian ideals, the Bill of Rights, all at that same time happening. This gives us a feeling for the planet itself and what it brings in, what it brings into our consciousness. The second drop. Some years later, another planet. Again, we have the trough. We have the two waves. 1846. Neptune. Neptune, the king of the water, the great oceans. There, we're going to have some big storms coming up here too, but of a different sort, very different than the uh, Uranian type of, of upset. We have the transcendental movement. Thoreau, Emerson, <laughs> that, that sense that here innate within us, we have this um, a divinity. And so, so much of the time prior to that, you know, it's like, look up there, look up there. It's like, okay, yeah, yeah, we can't forget that, but yes, right here, and right here in this group, the, it's kind of like the ocean of who we are here together, we're united in this place right here, and if we can stretch it and, and really expand it, there is a divine humanity. Can we really go out that far? And, we, and uh, the ideal, let's say, of Jesus, of that um, love thy brother as thyself, very expansive, but also a bit muted, sometimes abstract. We had religious revivals during the 1840s, 1850s. Chautauquas, you know what a Chautauqua is? Um, from New York, a Chautauqua was a <coughs> religious revival. And people coming together and getting excited and uh, having conversions. The Mormons came during this time, Joseph Smith, and then the persecutions and the exodus from that group. Then there was this really interesting thing. This is getting us now into tricycles. There was a false prophecy at that time. It was the 22nd of October, 1844, and Jesus would return, and that would be the end of the world. Well... <laughs> This was a, a, a man by the name of Miller and all of his followers called the Millerites, and they uh, uh, expected that. He prophesied that it did not happen. And then they had the great disappointment. This is a very Neptunian idea, Neptune. 
it was a time of utopian ideals. Uh, Charles Fourier, um, these different groups getting together, having these communes, they were really quite uh, excited about that. We can get together in our, in our uh, groups and see if we can create something. Again, all equal here. At the same time, on the larger things, remember some of these planets also bring in um, extremes. And so then we're talking about beliefs, belief systems, sometimes uh, BS. Um, and the, one of the beliefs was the manifest destiny. It is our mission, our destiny to cover this land, this North American piece of land from coast to coast. And the Native Americans experienced that one. And then we had the Mexican War. We had Texas. Um, these were the other sides of these belief systems because part of that belief system was that there were superior <laughs> cultures and inferior cultures, probably savages, and we will help them by conquering and showing them the right way. This was also the time of the Communist Manifesto. Karl Marx wrote in 1848 the Communist Manifesto, right there in the middle. The interesting thing, uh, by the way, about that was that at, just at that time, as Neptune was discovered, plop, plop, and these spiritual ideas and, and humanity and so forth, and the extremism, um, uh, Saturn joined Neptune at just that time. And Saturn brings in another kind of interesting uh, feeling because it is kind of no-nonsense, pragmatic, time, government, what, what's going to happen now? Come on, let's do it. But it was mixed with Neptune. We're all one, and the people, and and then Karl Marx says, yeah, so you know, communism, you know. And there's a really interesting dynamic that in our modern era, in the Aquarian age, whenever Saturn and Neptune come together, there is a communist movement, and, it, and it's been shown since the 1840s. Very interesting. The second part of the plop, the Neptunian thing then was the American Civil War. And it was the Emancipation Proclamation and the freedom, freeing of the slaves. In Russia, it was the uh, freedom of the serfs. Same time, coincident. Louis Pasteur made the first successful pasteurization process. Florence Nightingale, nursing, and hypnosis came on the scene, as well as um, the uh, spiritualist movement, seances, rapping. Yeah, yeah. So all of that is, was part of this Neptune uh, energy. Are you ready for the third drop? <laughs> yes. 1930. Which planet? Pluto. Pluto. 1930. Can you imagine the two waves? on each side of 1930. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. World War I, mm -hmm. World War II, depression in the middle, the prohibition, the desire to regulate morality, prohibition, to prohibit, and their ideal was, was fine, it was really so-called inspired, that uh, alcohol was the evil, and so we just have to make it illegal. And uh, then came the underworld reaction to that, the mob element and so forth. Pluto is the king of the underworld. Mm -hmm. Amazing, huh? Just coincidental, maybe. <laughs> but in reaction to that, in, in kind of trying to fix that, um, FDR and the New Deal, so, social programs, social security, and infra infrastructure so that let's create jobs. And I think with, um, not far from here, we've got this Skyline Driveway and the, and the park uh, up here. That was a, that was a New Deal um, program to create jobs, not from the private sector, but from the government, because things were really kind of chaotic and you know out of control. At the end of the second trough, we had the atomic bomb in 1945. You don't mess with Pluto. 
Shall we gnash our teeth again? <laughs> Let's take a break. There are cycles, like bikes and tricycles. And then there are ephemeral cycles and false prophecies and those, those predictions that really don't come true. And uh, these are sometimes called false alarms and things that we have to watch out for in the prediction world. And I'm in the prediction business and anybody who you know, works with astrology, tarot, cards, other types of divination, uh, channeling, psychics, and so forth, there's periodically there's going to be these predictions made. And if we can work with these great powers, then perhaps we're going to be a little bit more on track. But sometimes, and here most recently, uh, we've had a, a couple of things that you know really did not happen. Does anybody remember the Y2 cake? <laughs> <laughs> huh? That was going to really hit hard. 1999 to 2000, oh my goodness. You know, and then they just had to go working feverishly to change those numbers from two digits to four digits. My goodness, they spent millions trying to fix that. Well, maybe they fixed it and we didn't have the crisis, or maybe it wasn't a problem. We don't know. <laughs> it it uh, came and went. Not too long ago, uh, in May of 2011, we had yet another prediction that the world was going to end. It was a Christian Bible prophecy, and um, an older man who had really studied the <coughs> really fine details, the uh, sim symbolism in the Bible, he made his predictions, it didn't happen. And then we had 2012, and there were predictions and books and gatherings and projects and workshops, and the Mayan prophecy of 2012 was, of course, really big in the news at that time. And um, deep in the Guatemalan rainforest, they discovered an old uh, Mayan room painted with the calendar it had been left there for 800 years, and this is the part that people really don't know too much about. Um, and, and, I, and so let me quote this, because this is really uh, uh, quite funny. Uh, Nomen est omen, and the name, of course, is in the uh, product itself. So it says here, William Saturno, William Saturno, an archaeologist from Boston University was mapping the ancient Maya city of Jultan in northeast Guatemala in 2010. And when one of his undergraduate students peered into an old trench dug by looters and reported seeing traces of an ancient paint. And that was the find that I just talked about where they found an ancient Mayan calendar that the Mayans predicted that would happen in 2012. Now, what's the chances of that? <laughs> so as many people were kind of excited about what was going to happen, you know, the big things that were going to happen in 2012, something really indeed remarkable happened that their, one of their Mayan culture uh, pieces of wisdom was discovered and published in that very same year, 2012. Interesting. Okay, back to the big influences, okay? What happens when the mighty ones, when the big powers start aligning together? <clears throat> Uranus, remember from the 1780s, and Plato, remember from the 1920s, 30s, 40s? They came together, they aligned together side by side in the 1960s. Who remembers the 1960s? <laughs> <laughs> okay, then, then you weren't really living it. <laughs> <laughs> of course, student protests. Okay, civil rights, women and gay rights, questioning authorities. So much happened. Sex and drugs and rock and roll. Huh? The 60s. Peace, man. <laughs> Wars in foreign lands, people gathering together and, and confronting 
wrongs, authorities, and the status quo. Big times, political unrest, violence, but then of course the hippie peace movement, rock music, uh, gatherings, um, love festivals, and, and so forth. What a powerful time when these two got together, 1960s. And now, guess what, guess what? <laughs> They're back. <laughs> They're here. Uranus is in the uh, very individualistic sign of Aries and, and uh, has been since uh, March 11th, 2011. Anyone knows what happened then? Pluto in Capricorn since about 2008. Anybody know what happened to that? Okay. Fukushima, 2011. Big stock market crash, 2008. Coincidence when these guys are coming together, coming closer. It's now a square and has been a square since late 2010 through 2017. The 60s are back. <laughs> I'm actually excited about these revolutionary planets getting together because look at all of the things going on in our, our present time. And echoing back to the student protests. And are the students protesting? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Are the Arabs protesting? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been really quite uh, a time here. They're square, very intense. Back in the 60s, of course, we had some very famous assassinations. I'm, I'm happy that that's not happening now, but it seems to have kind of expanded into school shootings. Terrible, terrible stuff, and what can be done about that, you know? Debates, debates on the uh, uh, Aries side of we shall have our independence and you can't tell us what to do. And then on the Capricorn side, well, the government really should do something, but mm, what about mm, civil rights and individual and the, and the Second Amendment and so forth? It's really quite a time, but it is like the 60s, you know, where people are questioning authority and what's happening really. And I think there's a conspiracy going on, and, and what's, what's, uh, what's really behind what they're telling us. It is just, I mean, it's so much uh, a part of this. And the dissatisfied youth in various countries, and people in Arab countries toppling those old dictators, those old uh, systems. But of course, uh, on the Pluto Capricorn side, you know, the established authorities fighting back. Um, Occupy Wall Street, Uranus, Wall Street says, Pluto, the 1%, all of these things. <laughs> um, we have then um, uh, climate change, and we have to do something. And, and all of this progress is actually polluting a lot. And... Um, uh, that something has to be done, but what? Lots of debate, lots of extremes, lots of very strong and sometimes shrill voices happening. But it's about time that we had some of these different changes, and some of these changes that, let's say, were planted in the 1960s are coming to fruition right now as they come back and revisit some of those the discussions and ideals and desires at that time. Last summer, what did the Supreme Court do? for uh, gay, uh, gay marriage, yeah. it is now legal. I heard that there's a problem with that in North Carolina. <laughs> no, not here, not here, no. Not in Iowa. <laughs> so, um, they're, they're coming back again, and again, the civil rights are, are very much in, in the uh, focus center right now. So basically, the radical individualist Uranus wants change and contrast now. That's Uranus, the revolution. While Pluto lurks in the shadows, the underworld, working up steam for a thorough transformation that will get to the core, because that's what Pluto wants. They could make a formidable team when they work together. Sometimes they're at loggerheads. We see people representing these various systems. Some one people, or one group of, of people, a little bit more on the Uranian uh, uh, Aries side, 
some people a little bit more on the Pluto Capricorn side, and some people with a kind of a combination of, well, can we work it out? Can we find some sort of compromise uh, here? Some people are afraid of losing what they have built up over a long period of time. So let's keep things as they are. Others say, it is so old, let's move on. Let's, let's scrap it and start again. That's, of course, the Eurasian side. You see this in many different ways. There is, of course, then the big picture that we're talking about with these uh, planetary uh, alignments and so forth. But then we have the personal picture. And so, again, as above, so below, here are some things that hopefully would be of interest to you personally with, with these really large, strong forces. Spirituality is calling. I think, I think you've already heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> but reactionary and recalcitrant types do not want to heed. What are we going to do? Separate separate ourselves from the negative. <coughs> there are negative influences, even though that might hurt and feel like a loss. There is a burning desire to overhaul several areas of one's personal life, and that can take many different forms, new house, new, new job, um, new relationship. It's, it's showing up here as one re-evaluates what it is that you have as your priority. So, we've got to clean out our cupboards, literally and metaphorically. You will come across very strong personalities. We see them in the news. And there will be emotions. There will be gnashing of teeth. So recognize that there are some of these forces beyond your control. But then what can you do about it? I think this is an election year. <laughs> and how are you going to choose? What are you going to vote for? That's what this is really about for us. In fact, I've got this little slogan, if you can repeat after me. This is an election year. This, this is an election year. year. Vote for me. Vote, vote for me. me. <laughs> <laughs> So the storms are blowing. Climate change, refugees, strife internationally, school shootings. Then we have, of course, hearkening back to the 1960s, the liberalization of the marijuana laws. I thought I'd never see the day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Bernie Sanders says that he's going to make it a federal law if he, we've let him in. He, of course, represents the Uranian Air, uh, Aries type. Huh? <laughs> Trump is over here in the Pluto Capricorn world. I mean, we, they're just showing up like as, as uh, uh, caricatures sometimes of these mighty forces going on. At the same time, what did we learn in the 1960s? What are we learning again right now? All that glitters is not gold. Be receptive, be perceptive. Make your choices. This is an election year. Read between the lines and listen to your own intuition. It is important during this time to act with integrity. If you have gone off the straight and narrow, consider it an adventure. <laughs> and recognize that as you are still striving to act, act ethically and with good heart, then it was a good lesson anyway. And so pick yourself up, re-choose, elect again, vote again, and move on to where you would rather go. I had uh, uh, mentioned uh, that we also have uh, uh, this, what I call the communist alignment, you know, Saturn and Neptune. And uh, briefly, I can tell you a couple of uh, interesting things about that. It's really kind of uh, uh, mind-blowing uh, what happens whenever they, they come together. And I mention it now because uh, they are also visiting, visiting us today. Besides the big, you know, Pluto, Uranus, we've got Saturn, Neptune doing a dance too. So uh, we go back to uh, 
the discovery of, of Pluto, 1846, and that was um, the alignment of Saturn and Neptune at that point. Um, Karl Marx met uh, Friedrich Engels in 1844. The Communist Manifesto was composed uh, and then published in 1848, Saturn-Neptune. A cycle later, 1882, Karl Marx died in 1883. The anarchists and social revolutionaries formed the International Working People's Association, 1882. One cycle next, 1917. World War One and Russian, Russian Revolution. The Russian Revolution, right on cue. One more cycle, 1953. Stalin died. Gorbachev joined the Russian Communist Party. <laughs> the Korean War ends, and the North is communist. Then there was a Vietnam forming. Get this, Vladimir Putin was born the 7th of October, 1952. I think he's an inside commie. <laughs> One more cycle. 1989, boom, the end of the Soviet experiment. The fall of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain, the Cold War ends right on cue. <coughs> Next cycle, 2025. You might think, well, 2025, okay, we've got a little, couple more months yet. <laughs> it's nine more years. It'll be interesting to see what happens then. Yeah. But in the meantime, Saturn is in Sagittarius, Neptune is in Pisces, and they are squaring right now. As of last autumn, very strong throughout the whole election year, and uh, we have got um, Saturn, which is um, wanting to have government, time, pragmatism, organization, and so forth having an argument, a debate, with Neptune, king of the seas, and uh, idealism, and so forth. And uh, here we have, as I mentioned before, the normalization of the of, uh, marijuana laws, and uh, also various other sorts of things, giving rights to uh, minorities and people uh, of color, looking at uh, other uh, innovations here. And then um, there's Bernie Sanders. I mean, again, like, like with the marijuana uh, thing, uh, someone who says publicly that he's a socialist and many millions of people are voting for him, like, again, I thought I'd never see the day. <laughs> but it is a Saturn-Neptune conversation going on. And uh, it's really quite amazing here. And the students, remember back to the 60s, the students are voting. They are protesting, they are voting, they are wanting to have their voices heard. Um, Saturn is sometimes very impatient with Neptune. It seems a bit vague and fluffy, and uh, what, what's you know what's really going to happen here, and who's going to pay for this? <laughs> but uh, Neptune doesn't care about that sort of thing. It's got a big vision, okay? And uh, so that's some of the, the tension going on right here, right now, all the way through. It started last last fall, as I said, all the way through this year, 2017. So, again, look at the big picture and then the personal picture. What does this mean for you? What can this really interesting time mean for you here? Imagine that you are the CEO of your own personal enterprise. Because you are. How are you going to set things up so that there is a balance in your life? Time, Saturn for all of the good things in life, Neptune, and still be productive and pay the bills. Saturn. Music is in the background. Inspiration. Great music here, by the way. Good job, guys. Inspiration, moving up the chakras, inspiring people to do the right thing. It's an election year. Vote. Who are you going to vote for? 
Me. Oh, you? Me. 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 You're creating the ambiance and your environment both in this place here, very good job, and also in your own homes, your gardens, your spaces, your quiet places, your meditation spaces, creating your environment, constructing it, and bringing the ideals and the uh, vision into your everyday uh, life. Philanthropy, charity, very Neptunian, are very much in the works and aiding when we join together holding hands in larger projects, that's where we can bring this heaven on earth. That's what it's also about. And then, of course, once you figure it all out and you're living it, you uh, tell the others in the neighborhood by getting the word out. And so sharing, and sharing your ideas, visions, and heart. So, that'll keep you busy for a couple of months. <laughs> The planets are one way of looking at times, eras, and epochs, as well as foretelling the future. But we have to watch out for those tricycles, those false prophecies, those interesting things that we might get alarmed about, but mm, don't really have to worry about them. Because we have free will. We have determination, and we have our own dreams, our own inspirations, prayers, and gumption. And then, back to the election year, what are our ideals? What are we choosing? You know, our personal platform, our ideal, living by them. Can we create our destiny and fate, even if there's a storm? I believe so. In the cold and snowy winters, in the mountain, some people die. Other people go skiing. You dress for the weather. You prepare. Get yourself um, uh, ready for contingencies. <clears throat> and then you are ready. You have to dress the part. Be smart. Check the big cycles, the little cycles, and the tricycles. It is now spring. Now it's time to get out our bicycles. <laughs> so, create your fate and make an adventure. It's been great being here with you, and I wish you all well. And who are you going to vote for? Me. 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 Namaste. Namaste.